Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Amos. Seek the Lord and live, or he will break out against the house of Joseph like fire, and it will devour Bethel with no one to quench it. Ah, you that turn justice to wormwood and bring righteousness to the ground. They hate the one who reproves in the gate, and they abhor the one who speaks the truth. Therefore, because you trample on the poor and take from them levies of grain. You have built houses of hewn stone, but you shall not live in them. You have planted pleasant vineyards, but you shall not drink their wine. For I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and push aside the needy in the gate. Therefore, the prudent will keep silent in such a time, for it is an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, will be with you just as you have said. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts, will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden. But all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. 
and then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, truly I tell you, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We meet a man this morning who possesses the holy trinity of success, wealth, youth, and power. And he takes the center stage of our story this morning. Though I do feel like I should be honest, uh, this morning and say that I usually try to skim or skip Mark chapter 10 altogether. It's a pretty tough read. It's about discipleship and the highlights of the discipleship are divorce, humility, and selling all your worldly goods. Super popular topics. Not controversial at all and definitely doesn't read as a checklist to be on our best Christian behavior. And I will say this morning, there seems to be a particular kind of irony for this to be our reading as we embark on our stewardship campaign. I think we also can have a very knee-jerk reaction to this text. Is God really asking me to sell all I possess? And I think there can be a defensiveness too Well, God helps those who can help themselves. But as I've been praying and preparing for the sermon this week, I've come to wonder if, in fact, have we missed the point? In fact, what if our reaction to this pericope, this story, has more to say about us than it has about God? So, we meet a man who possesses the holy trinity of success. And you can just bet that he was probably good looking too. Let's call him Frank. There is this sense of urgency about Frank when he hears that Jesus is in the area. He rushes to meet him, finds Jesus, assuming with the crowd and the disciples all around, and kneels before him asking, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And many of us may recognize this urgency, anxiety, or even just this exchange, for 
Who of us have not also questioned God in a similar way? Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus replies, well, you know the commandments, the law given to Moses for God's people. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, and no stealing, lying, or cheating. Yes, I have, since the days I was a child, kept them all. I'm ready for the grown-up answer now. So what more do I need to do? What more is asked of me? And I want us to just stop for a moment and wonder why Frank even went in search of Jesus. If Frank knows the law, and giving him the benefit of the doubt, let's say he has kept the law since he was a child, why is he worried about eternal life? He seems to have every reason to be confident. All of this money and possessions, which is clearly a blessing and approval from God, and he leads the virtuous life the law asks of him. And yet, he isn't certain. There is this perhaps nagging insecurity or this nudging of God in his soul, wondering, is it enough? Am I enough? And Jesus looks Frank in the eyes and loved him. I find it interesting that this is the only time in the Gospel of Mark that we're told Jesus specifically loves an individual. And because he loves Frank, Jesus answers this, only one thing is left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor and come follow me. And we can just imagine Frank's face as it falls. And that the eyes that were once peering into Jesus fall to the ground. As this is the last thing he, the disciples, or anyone else expected to hear. Grieving, he walks away with a heavy heart, holding tight to all of his possessions, needing that security of wealth, the safety of his own power, and he could not let it go. And I think before we cast judgment on Frank or assure ourselves that we most certainly would act differently, let us be honest. In their culture, in ancient Hebrew culture, and in our culture today, wealth opens doors. Wealth provides shields. Wealth gives people authority, deserved or not. Wealth can shield only for a time, but still it can shield aging, death, sickness, loneliness, and grief. Wealth provides the feeling of security. Wealth can help hide our vulnerabilities. And this morning, I do believe we could substitute education, job success, marriage, family, or any virtue in place of wealth. Frank wanted to love God, and he worked very hard to do what he thought was required of him to inherit eternal life. And Jesus loved Frank. Jesus asks Frank to surrender what holds him in captivity, the invitation to sell all he possess and to follow Jesus is not punitive. Jesus invites Frank to let go of all the things, the very things he believes he cannot live without, what he fears the most, what he loves the most, what he trusts the most, and sell it. Sell everything. Take the weight of your bank accounts and the treasury of your own merit and follow me. Come and follow. Join me on my journey to the cross because, Frank, you cannot do it alone. Come and see that the way into the kingdom of God is not through your own success, but in and through your failures. Not by the virtue of our lives, but by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because the truth 
The kingdom of God is for the little, the lost, the last, the loser, and the dead. Frank's assumptions about God and what pleases God ask, led him to ask what I think is the wrong question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That question assumes that there is actually something we could do or need to do to justify ourselves, prove ourselves, accomplish uh, the things, you know, we need to accomplish to make ourselves worthy before God. It assumes that eternal life, life with God, is something that we can earn and should earn and have to earn. But isn't that the exact opposite of inheritance? My Aunt Joyce died this last year, and a few months after her death, I received a letter informing me that she had left an inheritance for me. She left me my grandmother's engagement ring, a ring I didn't even know existed, a ring I didn't even know Aunt Joyce had, and she thought of me. And there was so much in this moment, there was so much joy in receiving that ring. Joy in recognizing Aunt Joyce's love for me. Joy in remembering my, grandfather, my grandmother. Joy in my heritage in a family. There was literally nothing I did or could do beside existing, which gave me my inheritance. There is nothing we can do besides existing to receive the inheritance of God. For it is the person Christ has died for, not the suit of clothes in which a person, in which we ourselves hide the bare truth of our vulnerabilities. And when Frank cannot let go of what he possesses, Jesus doesn't reject him. Jesus doesn't judge him. Jesus doesn't throw him away and say, well, he's a lost cause. Jesus laments. When we cannot let go of what possesses our love and trust, Jesus laments. Jesus is offering this gracious, loving acceptance found only in him, and Jesus laments and mourns the rejection of that acceptance. And friends, this in fact is grace. That Jesus divested himself from all of his power, from all of his glory, from all of his honor, from all of his riches, to become a servant who suffered and died on the cross so that in our own poverty we are made rich in faith of God. That we may experience the simple joy of receiving, friends, what is already ours, which is eternal life. That we may rejoice and come to terms with the fact there is nothing that I could do because it is already mine. It is already yours. It reminds me of the uh, parable of the prodigal son, the eldest son, who's standing outside wondering how people can be happy because he has done the work. He has stayed. He has been faithful. And the father comes out, and it's these devastating words, all that I have has always been yours. All that God has has always been yours. And it is in our baptism that we know we have been made heirs of God. I think part of the good news for us this morning is that we, in fact, do not know Frank's end. Perhaps Frank could never let go of all the things he possessed, could never let go and enter into this gracious acceptance of Jesus. But also, perhaps Frank was in the crowd at the foot of the cross. Perhaps Frank was present at Pentecost to hear the words of Peter and the good news of receiving what God has offered. You have died in the waters and been raised to new life in Christ. All that you have and all that is, that is, is a gift from God. We have been given the answer and assurance of our eternal life with God. 
I mentioned before that I thought it was a peculiar type of irony that we are reading this scripture as we embark on being stewards of God's grace. Of all the things that we have inherited, we've inherited the joy of this community, the beauty of this building, and all that we possess is a gift from God. And so this morning, the invitation is first to receive the gift that has already been given, and then to steward what we have to share the grace of God. To think about what it means to invite people into grace, to receive it ourselves, and how can we as Calvary Church be a beacon and a faithful steward of God's grace. We're in this together, my friends. Take confidence and assurance in this moment that eternal life is yours And Jesus offers it freely. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With With the the Father Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray to the living God, saying, hear our prayer. For the Church, for the Anglican Communion, and for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury. For the Episcopal Church, and for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Sean, our presiding bishop-elect. For the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and for Ketlin, our bishop. For Calvary Church, and for our clergy and staff. For generosity in our response to God. Bring us to the throne of grace where we may receive your mercy. Living God, in your mercy. For this community, the nation, and the world, for all people in their daily life and work, for all who have been affected by hurricanes Helene and Milton, for those affected by domestic violence, for all who serve our country, particularly Christine, Trace, Robert, Chris, George, Brian, and Lauren, for their families and for the safe return of those far from home. Inspire us all to resist evil and to establish justice. Living God, in your mercy. For those who endure affliction and adversity, for Phyllis, Pam, Mark, Becky, Pam, Judy, Phyllis, Marie, Betty, Dick, Diana, Kate, Kathy, Claire, Paula, Kristen, Leslie, Marianne, William, Irina, Philomena, and all those who have been commended to our prayers. 
for people throughout the world living with HIV and AIDS, for those struggling with addiction and those in recovery, for strength for caregivers and healthcare workers, for those whom we now name. Give them your grace to help in time of need. Living God in your mercy, for those who have died, for David Oliver Nordby and Arabelle Lancaster, for those in whose memory altar flowers are given today, Philip and Mary Martha Thomas, Suzanne Hosford, Marvin Patterson, and Malcolm Lewis, for victims of gun violence, for all who mourn, for those whom we now remember. Through Christ, bring them to rejoice around your heavenly throne. Living God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I want to welcome everyone this morning to Calvary Church. It's a joy to be here together to receive the word and sacrament. Um, I want to welcome anyone who is visiting for the first time or the first time in a long time. We would love to meet you um, and invite you into our, our life here at Calvary. You're invited to fill out a visitor card, which is in the pew rack in front of you. You can drop it in the offering plate or pass it off to a clergy person at the end of our service. Just a couple of announcements for us this morning. It's hard to believe, but the beginning of, no of November is almost here which means All Saints Day is almost here. So on All Saints Day, Friday, November the 1st, we will be having a noonday Eucharist in the Lady Chapel in which all are invited to attend. We'll observe the holiday on Sunday, November the 3rd, and at our 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 5 p.m. services, we will also be including a necrology. Um, and so there is instructions here in your bulletin uh, leaflet about how to submit a name that you would like to have included in the necrology. Uh, so please do. We want to remember those who have been triumphant and have eternal life in God that have gone before us. Um, at today's service, we'll also uh, be having healing prayer um, in the Lady Chapel. After you receive communion, if you would like uh, to receive some healing prayer, there will be a priest that will meet you in the Lady Chapel uh, immediately following your taking um, communion. The annual bazaar is coming up November the 16th, so please uh, save the date for that. And I also just want to make special men uh, mention of um, our ongoing stewardship campaign, which indeed is faithful stewards of God's grace. As you pray and discern what God might be asking uh, for you and of you in our life at Calvary, let us remember that we have received the greatest gift and how might we share that gift with one another. Let us walk in love as Christ has loved us and gave himself an offering and a sacrifice.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.